The Sunday Baroque podcast is made possible by WSHU and the Friends of Sunday Baroque. You can find out more about the Friends of Sunday Baroque and find out how to become one yourself by visiting our website, sundaybaroque.org, under the Contact tab. Venezuelan viola da gamba player Lauri Gutierrez is founding director of La Dona Musicale, a nonprofit organization and internationally acclaimed ensemble dedicated to the performance of Renaissance, Baroque, and classical music by women composers in a historically informed manner and to the performance of women's contemporary music. She's also a specialist in early music from Spain and the New World. The award winning musician joins me on Zoom to talk about her work as a performer, scholar, teacher, and advocate. Welcome. Thank you, Susanna, for having me today in this wonderful uh, program. Sunday Baroque is, uh, has a great impact in music. I have been hearing a lot of friends telling me they heard La Donna um, Musicale in your program as you have been playing uh, snippets. And th- this, these are people that are coming from Seattle, Indiana, very different places. So you're making an impact um, and um, in general, and I am thankful that to be here today. Oh, I, I'm thrilled to hear that because your recordings are really, uh, they really fill an important role in, in the repertory, and they're just fine, fine performances. So I'm, it's a real privilege to be able to play them. Um, I want to just ask you a question, though, first about this, you know, this strange and unprecedented time in our world. I'm trying to, to touch base with musicians when we speak and find out how have you been doing during COVID? I mean, things are things are restrict. The restrictions are loosening up a little bit now. But how how has that been going for you and for your ensembles? It's hard not to say that it has been overwhelming. It has been an overwhelming experience to try to deal with the reality, the limitations, and then continue to be committed to performing music and to making music happen in this world. More than ever do we need music. So um, after the feeling of being overwhelmed, I think the, the next stage is how do we deal with this? And um, La Donna, both La Donna and Rumba Rocco have tried um, our best. I think the challenge for small organizations like us is, is financial because now we have not only to pay the musicians and to pay the usual expenses, but now we have other expenses, the expenses of live streaming and learning how to live stream. And so it's been quite a challenge. But in the midst of all this challenge, I think the important part is that it has made us think globally. Now, I am playing a concert in Boston, but anybody in the world can listen to us. So that's very exciting. That's really exciting. So I'm, I am ready to just move on, stop, stop whining. It's not going to change. We need to uh, accept that the reality has changed. And I hope mm-hmm. institutions, schools, and all of that would learn to take advantage of this opportunity. Now, for instance, in, if we have, say, a Viola da Gama Society conclave, we might be able to invite somebody from Spain and not have to wor- be worried about the costs or the pandemic itself. And so, of course, it's going to limit how we teach. Um, but there is a lot that we can do. So I'm excited about the new propositions. I'm worried, of course. Uh, at the moment, we are getting ready for a, a tour. Yes, we are ready to a tour. We're going to Maine, Florida, and we're taking all possible precautions. And uh, we're going to have to f- figure out, but the singers are going to have to sing with a mask. Mm-hmm. So... Then you new, new challenges. Are we going to mic them? Uh, how are we going to do this? But we are not going to stop making music. There is a commitment to keep bringing the music of women composers, to be bridging the worlds of the old and the past, the popular and the uh, learned. And so we are stronger than ever in our mm-hmm. commitment to fulfill our missions. And I hope the audience will go along with us. Mm, I love that optimism. Thank you.
So let's talk about you personally. What was your own introduction to music? Were you from a musical family? You know, what was your first instrument and, and how did you get into playing it? So um, the uh, day I was born, my father came to the hospital and I, with a, a bunch of friends and gave a serenade, serenade to my mom. So my first encounter with my father was with music. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, later on in life, uh, it was that encounter because he played um, by ear and he would invite people to come to the house and play. And so I watched them. They were not reading any scores and they were improvising. So that mm -hmm. that really caused a great impact in, in my uh, psyche, uh, how these people uh, were enjoying themselves uh, because they didn't talk, you know, it was really strange because when you invite people, people, you know, chat and all that, there was a minimal talk, uh, conversation. It was just this song after song after song and, you know, I, I, until the wee hours. So it, it was quite exciting. Neat, neat. So, so what, what instrument did you play then? What, what, how did you, you get started? So the Venezuelans all, uh, tend to learn the, the first uh, instrument that we, get in our hands is called the cuatro, the Venezuelan cuatro, which has four strings. And so um, um, that's the instrument that was in the, in the house. But it was my sister, my second sister, who in an interim of uh, a year that she had to wait to enter the university, brought a guitar to the house. And so she, she was the one that went to school, music school. So I was uh, watching her uh, do her exercises and then her year was over and she left and left the guitar. So I took up the guitar and I went to the school that she was going to school. And I, that's how I, I began with a guitar and the quattro, of course. Ah, so then how did you find your way to Viola da Gamba? I know, I know. So um, <laughs> we, um, as a family, we move uh, very often. And so um, in one of the moves uh, that we did where when we went to Caracas mm -hmm. and, um, I went to a concert um, just out of the blue. I just decided to go to a concert. And all of a sudden, I see this instrument called the viola da gamba and the sound. And I, this is haunting sound. And I said to myself, oh, this is what I want. And it took me about two or three years before I got an instrument in my hands. Mm. Mm -hmm. So... Um, because, you know, the viola da gamba is not like a, a violin. It's an instrument that it takes time to, um, to be able to, um, to get, to build it, to find it. And, and in Venezuela, it's not the everyday instrument. And it's so interesting to hear you talk about how excited you were when you heard it, because so many musicians I speak with who specialize in playing historical instruments, and, it, and whether it's a string instrument or a wind instrument or whatever, they all, almost always say they felt this sort of instant affinity for the sound of the instrument and for the feel, for the ease of playing it. It really was just like the hand and glove, a natural fit. Was, was it like that for you, too, when you finally got the instrument? The interesting part is the resonance of the instrument that um, it seems to be t touching somewhere very deep in your soul and, and an immediate kinship that, mm -hmm. that is developed, a, a disconnection that is very profound and um, uh, unbelievable. I mean... <laughs> you know, I was I was speaking with a, a contemporary composer, um, Malika Fitzhugh, in in your area, actually, in the Boston area, who writes contemporary music, but for early instruments. And when she was talking about some of the music that she wrote initially for cello, and then her friends played it on uh, gamba, she said um, she kept saying she, it it sounded like chocolate chocolate the gamba sounds like chocolate so it's it, there is something about it the different resonance the timbre is just uh, yeah uh, sometimes we think of velvet velvet um, because mm -hmm. of the uh, suavite of mm -hmm. the sound of the instrument so uh, you know that's how I, I fell in love with it mm -hmm. so music really is your life's work I'd like to know how and when you really knew that when when you knew that in your core you know, I, I've been trying to figure it out myself um, as I uh, go into different uh, periods of my life. I, I think that um, 
it was an intricate part of my life in that we had the music around us all the time. But um, the commitment to um, to dedicate your life to it, it it's it's challenging because I, in at school I, I started as being as a, a a leader and I almost went into politics rather, and so I um, I was in the elections for student leader at my high school and then i realized how difficult and challenging it was because people don't play by the rules and i so much want to play by the rules and um the uh, we we launched an independent candidacy for myself and uh, we went very far but it was um it was not all quite uh by the rules so i i was uh, very dis- disenchanted but in in that um, <laughs> it's very funny because in that uh, moment I had a from one of because we, we were independent our party was independent no affiliated to any of the political parties I challenged one of of the political parties and I said if I win you're going to find me a scholarship to study music and then even though I lost he fulfilled his promise. And he found the scholar. He helped me find a scholarship for myself, and mm-hmm. that's how I came to the United States. So that moment where um, I realized politics—you needed to have a little stronger stomach to mm-hmm. weather the 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 challenges of being a politician. Then I went to my one passion uh, of music, and finding the scholarship was, you know, was. A pass. I thought, well, maybe this is my pass because mm-hmm. I have a way now to improve my my studies and dedicate myself um, to. And um, be aware, I came to the United States with no English. I mean, maybe present tense. And um, so we had we had to study. I, I had to learn English like in six months and then go to university. Wow. So, so wow. Um, the, the commitment to 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 uh, dedicate my life to music came at that probably at that point uh, where I got the opportunities. And, and therefore, later, as, as I went on, I was so lucky every time to, to find the right people to uh, give me a hand, to lead me to the schools, to give me a scholarship. And, and I can name all these people that have allowed me to be who I am right now. Mm-hmm. You have really made it quite a a mission and a priority to shine a light on underrepresented musicians and and really research and flesh out their lives and careers. How do you do that? How do you how do you find them? How do you proceed with the research? How do you flesh out the people they were? Well, I like to start with 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 where I come from. Um Venezuela is, is an incredible country. And in, um, in literature, there's something called magic realism, where fantasy is, 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 becomes part of, of the reality. And so when I, when I learned how to read, it was, I, re, I learned from a blind person. So that's magic realism. How can you learn from, a, from, to, to read from a, from a blind person, the, my neighbor, uh, just will call me up and say, you, you're old enough to learn. I, I wasn't, I, I was, I, I, I still hadn't gotten to, to, to school, but, but she taught me how to read. And when I went to, to, to my school, I already knew how to read. I, I had an advantage. And so that, that moment was magical to me to be able to, to have a slight advantage over my school, my classmate, because a blind woman decided to take me under her 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 wing and and teach me. So um, every time in my life, I have had uh, a, an underprivileged person or myself being an underprivileged person um, extend a hand and and bring sh- light over and shine over a project. So. Um, Later on, in when I was um, at, at Indiana University, uh, it, 
this is, seem, seems to be a theme. I was uh, playing the San, San Matthew Passion. It's a very, you know, it's a very important um, piece of work for, for the viola da gamba. And as I played, there was this lady in the chorus that came to me and said, oh, you are so expressive. And she was blind. Because she was blind and she could tell, she could feel my, my passion for the music, she connected. And for me, that was a gift because that has been the gift that comes after a concert. People come in to, to say, and you have touched my soul. And when I discovered that this is, this is the case, that I could, through music, be a vehicle to touch people's lives, I understood that there was, there was all these other lives and music that could be brought to light. And um, the crucial part at this moment is being at Indiana University under the um, leadership of, of Thomas Binkley. And um, Thomas Binkley, controversial as he was, he taught us to dig in, to look, to make our own uh, uh, additions to, to search. And, um, he, he really made a huge impact. And then the university give, gave us this, this, the tools to research, how to research, how to read this music. And we have to, I've been mentioned this. We had to pass an exam where we needed to, uh, side read a piece of music we've never seen and tell what period, etc. So I am in Indiana University is Women's History Month. And I realized there isn't one woman composer represented. There were women performers, but not composers. So I went to Thomas Binkley and he said, oh yeah, Barbara Strozzi, Jacquet de la Guerre. And I said, well, there is so much more than that. And so I, I uh, of course, uh, Karen Pendle, uh, Claire Fontaine, all these uh, musicologists did a lot of legwork identify uh, many musicians and my job was to find this course and interpret it and one of my big um, musicians of course is Antonia Bembo um, and um, I, I think that it's it, she's an amazing composer but it is uh, hard to understand her I, I still have uh, musicians telling me uh, you know I cannot make sense out of this mm -hmm. and um, I, I have one anecdote about Antonia Van Boy fight. So, um, <laughs> uh, so we are touring in Colombia. And, um, of course, I'm, uh, this is La Dona Musicale. Uh, uh, we're presenting a concert and, uh, the audience, uh, we get, uh, to talk to the audience right after the, the concert. And I was talking about Antonia Bembo and the woman raised her hand and said, Oh, but, I understand her so well. She just, again, she just touched my soul. You see, I am bipolar and I understand how is she going from one mood to the other. And one of the things is the challenges of Antonia Bembo is that sometimes she, she goes from major to minor in, 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 in a beat and, mm -hmm. and you need to make sense of this. And so it was, it was, uh, it was rewarding that somebody could identify herself with this composer. And so I thought, Bringing light to I mean, bipolar is you could consider a disability, disability, but it still allows you to function and to enjoy music. And this composer mm -hmm. might have, you know, had suffer of that. Or, I don't know, but her music is uh, undoubtedly worth listening to, and uh, was uh, was uh, good that uh, somebody was allowed to to connect with her because of her condition. So, yeah. so. I think it's important to to enjoy the the big classical, but I think it's important to also give light to these wonderful composers that that uh, that did did compose. And 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 I think his with Antonia Bembo particularly, what is fascinating is that nothing stopped her. She wrote and wrote and music, and it wasn't. It's not like Barbara Strozzi. Barbara Strozzi, her music was being published which is a big deal, but Antonia Bembo's music was not. And mm -hmm. she kept at it because mm -hmm. that's probably was her lifeline. Yeah. Something yeah. That, that kept her alive. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you have the two recordings of music by Antonia Bembo and, and uh, music the airs by Julie Pinel and other Parisian women and Anna Bone. Who else should we know about that we don't know enough about? Uh, there are many, but um, <laughs> the, the big one that um, I think I will be happy to send you some of, of our la- latest recording is, um, is a completely different composer, is um, Maria Teresa Agnesi. And she's important because she... Um, Antonia Ben was writing chamber music, and did, she did write um, a few uh, larger um, pieces, including an opera. But it is uh, Maria Teresa Agnesi who has larger chamber music, chamber oh. operas that you would consider. And um, during pandemia, <laughs> we did uh, a recording of um, of uh, some of uh, of her aria, La Insubria Consolata, and um, I think it's great music. It's very likable. It's, you know, very opposite Antonia Bembo. It's, it's very easy to like and, uh, it's really wonderful music. And, uh, mm. why, why not, um, um, perform and, just, um, and, and what is, I think is what interesting is interesting again is her connection with other, um, uh, royalties and the de- dedication to her music and books that we have, um, um, uh, manuscripts of her music uh, showing up in in in, in Paris, um, mm. and that's where I I found these uh, uh, manuscripts that I was um, uh, able to put in 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 a concert, uh, which we li- live stream. So because of the of the COVID, we had to record the winds separately. And so we had these strings, and we were all kind of precautioned in this wonderful. Um, church in Newton that thanks Andrew M- Manson allowed us to to bring the whole ensemble there. It was a big church with o- o- all the possibilities so that we wouldn't get um, COVID. And and then the winds we had to go to studio and um, Antonio Oliarte and had the master uh, work of putting it all together with mm-hmm. with our guidance. So Maria Teresa Agnes is undoubtedly uh, a a, a, a great composer worth listening and and I'm I'll be happy to share some some of this music with you we have not uh, produced a CD you know I nowadays um, we don't do CDs anymore and we have changed so much with the digital world so we, we're trying to figure out how because now we have a video so maybe we'll be distributing as a video not just to sound, as a sound file only yeah yeah excellent excellent now, you, you also have a musical ensemble called Rumba Rocco, which plays Latin Baroque fusion. Talk about what that means and, and what someone might expect to hear at a Rumba Rocco concert. Well, I, let me just tell you, I just back up a little bit how Rumba Rocco is born. As you know, and I bring up Venezuela because it's where I came from and where I learn so much in terms of music and in terms of who I am. Around 2014, in my last trip to Venezuela, I realized that I, I wasn't going to go back um, to live there uh, anymore. I, I had my citizenship here in the United States. I, I have a, a natural a waiver to because of the work I do. The United States wants me. So I, I was looking for unique work that I wasn't taking somebody's job as an immigrant. I wanted to bring something to, to the United States. And I realized as I did my DNA test that um, I, I was compound different races, and that is a lot of what Latin America is. The fusion of, of cultures, races, it's been, had been in my mind, even when I was in Indiana. What does a South American early music musician sound like? Because mm. I, I am not European. I am Latin American. So, and there was music being created and performed in Latin America. So how does, how that should that music sound? And um, I had wonderful, I am in Boston, so I had wonderful Latin American musicians here, early music musicians. And so um, I invited them and we started to do this work. But what, what I think is, is important, a, a, a few things are important. Again, the underprivileged, you know, the popular music is, is seen by classical music as underprivileged, as like second class music. Yeah. Whereas I don't think it's that case because there is an oral tradition in every country that has played a role in the making of, of classical music. And uh, we have Josquin de Press, for instance, using popular, popular mm-hmm. tunes to make their masses. So 
it being by, by the religion using popular elements to attract the the unruly natives <laughs> or or whatever reason the composers had uh, popular music has a a role in 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 our lives at least in my life mm -hmm. and when you when you look at the trujillo codex this is the uh, um, peruvian codex uh, companion called this is also called th this was compiled by someone in the 18th century and it he transcribed some of this music. Now, nowadays, musicology will call him a, a ethnomusicologist, but as early music musicians play from that codex. So when I see this codex, and that's one of the pieces, we're playing Tonada del Congo. So when you see Tonada del Congo and you see the notes, how as a South America am I going to play this piece? I have to bring elements of the oral tradition. And so to make up for the rhythm that is not written in the score. It's, it was usually the case, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that it wasn't played. So mm -hmm. um, when you come to a concert of, of Rumba Rocco, I think what is important to know is the concert is going to be made by the musicians. The ideas are mine, yes, but my ideas are not enough if the musicians that are there are not going to put themselves into the piece. And because they put themselves into the piece, each concert is different. Mm. So you you can have the same Diego Ortiz piece play in one concert and another, and then you listen to it in another concert, and it's going to sound different mm. because it depends who is playing. Because the improvisations that each instrumentalist is bringing in are different. So I think it's fresh, and I think that is the main importance for Rumba Rocco is making early music sound fresh, mm -hmm. sound new, sound passionate, because that's Baroque, conveying the effects of the music by um, also tapping in the oral traditions that have that are still present in our country. So when we're playing Tonada del Congo, we're bringing in the Peruvian Atajo, Atajo de Negritos. It's a Peruvian dance that led to another dance called Festejo. And so it's all very, very, very related. And we want to find this, these relationships and connect, even if they are imaginary relationships, we still want to connect. Because the important thing with music is connecting. There's no point to be all dogmatic and say, this is the way it should sound. No. You know, I think it's, it's important for us to stay fresh, mm -hmm. to stay alive, to stay uh, present, and um, to stay passionate. Yeah. And it's so interesting that you say this, too, because um, what I'm reminded of is, you know, well how, well, how do we define genius? I mean, part of the thing of genius are the people that make it their own, the people that push the boundaries, the people that create something that's new and different and fresh. It's not the people who do it the same way as everyone else has done it forever. You know, it's it's when you push those boundaries that that's what art is. That's what makes genius. That's what makes it art. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth is, I, I just find there is room for everyone. You know, people can choose to play the way they want. I mm -hmm. think in Room Barocco, we decided whoever comes, I, I warn them, I bring a score and we try things out. And mm -hmm. um, it can drive people crazy. You know, <laughs> I, I have a musician that, you know, uh, couldn't stand it. And, and, and others is like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, let's add this and this, let's do this. And that is exciting. And at some point I, I have to say, okay, this is it. No, no more trial. We're doing it like this. And that's, you know, that's also hard. Yeah. People are still wanting to, oh, I, I, I just have one more idea. And I say, okay, it's a, it's a very um, uh, delicate role where you encourage and at the same time, there's a point that you say, okay, we, this is what we're going to do, at least for this concert. And that's what, uh, you know, my, my savior is, at least for the concert, we're going to do this and this and this. And um, for this tour that we're doing, uh, we're bringing instrument. I just ordered an instrument from Peru 
a, a crucial in, uh, percussion instrument that uh, is like a charrasca, but it's not a charrasca. And we wish that we could play all the guitars that 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 each country requires, because this is the beauty. So the, the, the beauty of finding this connection, you, you see the Renaissance guitar is this instrument um, with a tuning that and a shape that in each Latin American country became something different. Mm -hmm. And it has its particular sonority, but the essence is the Renaissance guitar, which, which the Renaissance guitar also comes from from the oud, you mm -hmm. know, or the lauds and all of that. So it, each one has, even if it's distant cousin, it, it's all related. And finding these relationships, I think, is and finding the ways to be to stay connected, I, th I think, is is a way to bring us together and stop thinking that you know we need to be different in in that you are less than I am or that I am more than you are. I think that is what is important with our efforts to bring people together. And, and it's not easy because mm -hmm. I, I will confess, um, when I have a popular musician and a classical trained musician, it, they're two very different worlds. And even the understanding of something so mathematical as the beat is different. And it has yeah. been an incredible learning experience to see why the United Nations doesn't work. It doesn't work because everyone thinks that they are right. Yeah. Everybody thinks that they are right and, and they're not listening to the other person. And yeah. so I, to me, this, this is, uh, been a, an incredible experience to create Room Barroco because it has taught me not only musically, but has taught me about people. Yeah, really very much a, a metaphor for life and psychology. <laughs> Well, I have been speaking on Zoom with Venezuelan viola da gamba player Lauri Gutierrez, a performer, teacher, and scholar, and the founding director of La Dona Musicale in Rum Barroco. Thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. It's been a delight. Thank you, Suzanne. And again, I applaud you for the great work that you are doing to spread the word, to yes. um, teach other people about the wonderful music of uh, classical music and other music coming into your program. Um, thank you again for this invitation.